Bueno, arrancamos. Eh, Grant Romer fue a la Eastman House en 1975 al ingresar en el programa de posgrado de fotografía del Instituto Tecnológico de Rochester. Obtuvo su licenciatura en el Instituto Pratt, donde, comen donde comenzó estudios formales de historia de la fotografía en 1964, mientras estudiaba Bellas Artes. Mientras se especializaba en la historia del daguerrotipo y en su práctica, empezó a trabajar con Alice Swan, por entonces conservadora de fotografía de la Eastman. Tras la marcha de Swan en 1978 y el establecimiento del perfil de conservación en la institución, Grant Romer se convirtió en su conservador. Guiado por un fuerte compromiso para compartir los recursos de aprendizaje del museo, abrió el laboratorio a otros medios de inter, a, a, por otros medios medio de internados, contribuyendo al desarrollo profesional de muchos especialistas internacionales que hoy lideran el campo. En respuesta a una creciente demanda para el aprendizaje de la especialidad de preservación fotográfica, Grant Romer creó el programa de preservación, perdón en inglés, Certificate Program in Photographic Preservation and Archival Practice, de la Eastman en 1989. Este programa sirvió finalmente de base al Advanced Residency Program in Photograph, in Photo Photograph Conservation, que Grant Romer ha dirigido durante todo su periodo de vigencia. En 2009, después de toda una vida de éxito en la institución, se retiró. Grant Romer es mundialmente conocido como conferenciante y autor de muchos temas de historia de la fotografía y de conservación. Le damos la bienvenida y nos ajustamos al, al funcionamiento que, que planteó Daniel. Thank you very much. I'm uh, very grateful uh, to have the invitation to be here, uh, to make a contribution and to participate in this uh, event. Uh, and I am also extremely grateful for the support that I have been given to enable me to travel here. I need not tell anyone in this audience that photography is a wonder, but it is always good to remind everyone that photography is a wonder. Experiencing the wonder of photography is really the, the one thing that has kept me involved with photography from the first experiences that I had as a young boy that made me begin to be in a state of wonder. When one is in a state of wonder, one is questioning, one feels questions, but maybe does not yet have the question formed. You don't know what to ask, but you know you don't understand, you know you are feeling curiosity, uh, you know you want to know, but you don't know necessarily how. Many of us cannot really say why we are so deeply involved, so deeply attached, so deeply devoted to photography in whatever way we are, whether as artists or using it as a tool or through scholarly pursuit, uh, we still cannot necessarily answer the questions that we have about what is photography. Uh, it's, it's constantly provoking questions if you are conscious of it. And we have lost a lot of our consciousness of the wonder of photography, its ability to surprise, its ability to amaze, its ability to delight, its ability to draw you passionately into uh, an exploration and use of Again, it's hard to say exactly what. Anyway, my talk is fundamentally about a wonder that I have had since uh, 1958. When I first became aware, through a book my father had given me, of uh, the camera that is very well known uh, in virtually every history of photography, uh, that uh, discusses the earliest days of photography in the world. Uh, you will find mention of Alexander Walcott and the camera uh, that he uh, designed and patented in 1840, which employs the principle of the uh, Newtonian telescope. It has no lens. 
It is illustrated in many, many histories of photography. It is illustrated all over the internet. This is the uh, site of the Smithsonian Institution uh, that is featuring some of its favorite things. The curators of different collections are putting forward objects that are being held in the national collection that have particular interest or curiosity. As you become sophisticated with history, you begin to understand that history is not necessarily the truth or all of the truth. Uh, it does not necessarily answer all of the questions uh, that are worth asking. Uh, certainly history is an inquiry. It's not what happened, it's what you ask about what happened. But this one object has consistently provoked uh, the interest and the curiosity of scholars and uh, photographers uh, from uh, the beginning of its uh, being filed as a supposed patent model in 1840. It is the first photographic patent held by anyone in the world, as a matter of fact. The daguerreotype uh, process itself was not patented. The uh, Giroux camera was not patented. There is no earlier example of a photographic patent in the world than for this object. And it uh, indeed describes it as a uh, working version, quite interesting, of the uh, uh, full-sized camera. If you can, you search the internet looking for Walcott camera, you'll find many other sites. Here's for the Oxford School of Photography, in which the commentary is interesting. It's put forward as the first camera patent. Indeed, that's what it is. And the commentary is that the patent number, blah, 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 surprisingly was taken out by Alexander S. Walcott, a man from New York. Why should that be surprising? Uh, I'm not sure. This is an English school, and they maybe think everything comes from uh, England or France in photography, uh, or at that early date it would be. But indeed, this is uh, a patent that's coming from the New World before anything else is patented uh, in Europe. And this question of control of intellectual property is very interesting in the history of photography. I'm not going to go into it, but that's largely been the, the reason it's in the history books, not because of uh, the novelty of its design, uh, not because of the significance it had in the development of photography, but because essentially it was the first of its kind, which is a patent, not necessarily as a camera design. He goes on to say that uh, uh, he is sure if asked without the uh, aid of Google, he would have said that George Eastman held the first patent uh, in photography. It shows how, pe how ignorant people are uh, about the uh, history of photography, that they could even say such a thing of all places in a school of photography. In 1958, I became aware of it, but only two years ago did I finally found my own way to examine that object. It remained an object of curiosity uh, throughout the years to me as I began to understand more and more of the context in which uh, one would value it. Uh, I became more and more curious to actually examine the object. Uh, it is remarkably small, and indeed that's part of the reason why it's taken to be the patent model. Uh, but it is not the only example of the Walcott camera that exists. In a small museum in Seiko, Maine, in the northern part, uh, northeastern part of the United States, is a small museum that has another example, the full-size example, of the Walcott camera. Uh, here you see it, uh, and it's little known, and little visited, and little seen, and little appreciated for what it is. <coughs> you all know the story of the announcement in uh, January of 1839 by the astronomer Arago that uh, he was in the process of submitting to the French government the proposition that the French nation acquire the rights 
to the invention of Daguerre, that he had indeed achieved the long-held dream of uh, fixing the image of the camera obscura, that he had indeed a practical system of photography. It wasn't until August of that year that the practical details were given out. It's an interesting story why there was a nine-month delay between the announcement, the official confirmation that the, the invention did exist. Daguerre had shown in 1838, throughout the year of 1838, examples of the daguerreotype to uh, a number of different people. It had indeed been seen and reported on in the French press, but it was the moment in which it was officially confirmed by an authority that the world recognized that indeed it was something uh, not just a hoax, but a reality. At that time in Paris, the American Samuel Morse, who was a portrait painter uh, by profession, was in Paris to sell his invention of uh, a form of telegraph. We know his name uh, today because of Morse, Morse code, the system of dots and dashes to give them the message. He's not the only claimant to an invention of uh, telegraphy, but he certainly, uh, for the United States, is considered like the Wright brothers to be the first to do that. Well, of course, uh, he is not the first uh, uh, by any means, but one of the first for sure. But he was in Paris at the time of the announcement, and he immediately wanted to visit Daguerre and view for himself the examples of his process. That was arranged by the American ambassador. He was received by Daguerre. He showed him examples, and you all know very well this image, which also is in every history of photography book. This image Morse described in a letter to his brothers in New York. It's one of the first accounts that reached the United States and was published, describing first-hand account of the daguerreotype, in which he very much stressed that a man having his shoes shined stayed still enough during the exposure, which was for more than three minutes, three to five minutes, uh, was the shortest time that uh, a reasonable image could be formed uh, by the process in the form that it was introduced. Uh, and uh, uh, he really began in the United States with this letter that his brothers published in their newspaper, an expectation and enthusiasm to find out the working details of the process. But he very specifically says in his letter that Daguerre himself did not think that portraiture was possible with this new invention. In another letter that Morse wrote to his brother, in which they did not publish the contents, he says, there's money to be made in applying this new invention to portraiture. Very specifically, he says, there's money to be made in applying photography to portraiture. The spirit of uh, the American of this period in which uh, there had been a Great Depression in 1836 that made many, many men begin to wonder how to make money and the spirit of uh, adopting technology uh, to profit uh, was really uh, very broadly held. And many other people in New York at this time, which was the largest city in America, uh, but the population was uh, much smaller than it is now. Here you see, those of you who know, uh, Manhattan, the end of Manhattan is where the city was. It went no higher than Houston Street at that time. The population was only 300,000 people. But of those 300,000 people, a lot of them were involved in a mercantile entrepreneurial spirit in which technology was seen to be the key to profit. This man, John Johnson, born in America, but descended from uh, uh, an English 
uh, immigrant family, first generation born in America, received the news of how to make the daguerreotype in October of 1836, October 6th, 1836. And that news fundamentally was, it was silver plate, it was iodine that was the sensitizing agent, and it was mercury by which the image was developed. No more information than that. It took from August 19th, when it was made public, to October 6th to reach New York. It's the earliest documented uh, date in which it can be clearly said that the news reached New York. It wasn't until some time later that the manual reached New York. The manual was not published in France until the second week of September of 1839 and did not reach New York until somewhat later in the month. Anyway, he brought the news to his friend, Alexander Walcott, who in the New York directory is listed as a dentist, but he was making dental tools. He wasn't actively working as a dentist. In this house that you see, on this site, the current building is, not, uh, is uh, built later in the 19th century, but the house that was on that site looked exactly like that, a two-story house with an attic. And he gave him the news, and he was too busy to do anything about it immediately. He said to Johnson, go get the iodine and uh, I have the mercury, uh, get some silver plates. Johnson was working in the jewelry business and uh, he w came back within two hours with the iodine and the silver plate. By that time, Walcott had designed the camera. The camera works on the principle of the Newtonian telescope, which uh, you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, Isaac Newton uh, invented this form of telescope in the late 1600s. Uh, it employs the principle of the uh, concave mirror to focus light, a very simple principle. Uh, again, the illustration here, uh, shows you the simple uh, principle in which the image is reflected back onto another mirror uh, viewed uh, at a 90 degree angle. One was able uh, to see in high magnification uh, the uh, uh, heavens and it had the advantage of not using a glass lens that caused chromatic aberration. By it being a first surface mirror, uh, there was no interference from, from the glass, no scattering of light, and therefore uh, it had a great advantage in making observations, although it wasn't widely adopted uh, in astronomy for uh, other reasons. Uh, it's interesting to note that Walcott understood this principle. We don't know much about his uh, life before. He was born in Connecticut. He was a young man. He was 30 at the time of 1839 that he receives this information. It seems that he was very well educated, particularly in the field of uh, optics and astronomy, which is amazing for that period. There was no American optical industry to speak of and very little uh, academic opportunity to uh, study on a level equivalent to the education in Europe in the field of optics. Anyway, here you see a Newtonian telescope. This is in the uh, Science Museum in London. It has the fundamental form, if you see from the front, of the Walcott camera itself. Seen from the front, it looks virtually like a telescope of this form. You see the mirror at the back and the frame for holding the plate. The achievement on October 6th, that afternoon, on the very day that he received the news, he designed the camera, he sent out Johnson again to have the box made, and that afternoon made two exposures, portraits of John Johnson in profile, standing at, in front of a window, and successfully achieved two portraits in silhouette, in profile, of Johnson, and immediately thought he had the key to the business of portrait photography. The exposure time 
that he achieved with these two little portraits the size of a fingernail uh, was one minute. Because there was no use of glass, no lens, the exposure time was greatly reduced. The distance from the imaging uh, surface to the plate was very short, so that an exposure of one minute, which was much more viable, uh, was the key to opening up a commercial portrait business. This camera was the first photographic patent of a camera in England also. There it's known as the Beard Camera. Richard Beard, we'll talk about in a little while. Uh, he had essentially uh, bought the rights to this camera. And this camera, strangely enough, is the basis of the beginning of the commercial photographic portrait business. This camera that is called a patent model, I believe, is actually the camera that was made on that day. It's not a patent model. It confirms absolutely to the description that uh, uh, was made by Walcott and Johnson later on in the 1850s. Uh, Johnson made a, a full description of this day. It's the earliest day that can be clearly documented that photographs were made in the United States. Uh, this camera was the working camera of that October 6th uh, day. It's not appreciated as such, but if you want me to prove it, I'll prove it to you. I made a little model of this camera to understand it. It's here for anyone who wants to, while we're here, take a look. This is basically the size of that camera. And uh, using the same size mirror, a one-inch mirror, uh, here you see my house. I use a bust of Abraham Lincoln, who you can recognize in profile. And if you can understand in the other picture, you see the small little inverted image upside down inside the camera. That's this camera without the top, so you can see what's working on the interior. Focus is made by moving that little tongue inside and out, which moves the area where the plate would be. Forms a beautiful image. Interestingly enough, not only does it form the image, but it's a correct image. Unlike the daguerreotype, which is a form of a direct image, you get a mirror reversed image. This camera produces a correct version. Left is left and right is right, not inverted as you see in the normal daguerreotype. There you see magnified the image created by that camera. <coughs> For many years, collectors paid no attention to these very early daguerreotypes. Uh, because they are not of the quality of later daguerreotypes, they were considered bad daguerreotypes or poor daguerreotypes. When I started to collect in the 1970s, you could buy for three, four dollars in the junk box the earliest of photographs made in America because they weren't appreciated as uh, being of high quality. Uh, here's an example that is undoubtedly a Walcott camera image and uh, made probably early 1840. Uh, and we see, the, again, the use of profile uh, in the presentation, not so much out of the convention of portraiture, but of the problem of facing a lot of light that was bounced from a forward direction into the face of the sitter. I'll show you in a second more. The image here of Henry Fitz uh, is an example, again, of a daguerreotype that was probably made at the end of 1839 or early 1840. Henry Fitz was the only American who was present at the announcement of the working details of the process in Paris. He was in Paris trying to get a connection with the French optical industry to begin to manufacture lenses in the United States. He later went on to become a significant manufacturer of lenses and telescopes. He's a very interesting figure. He was a friend of Walcott. And when he returned to New York, he gave Walcott first-hand account of uh, the daguerreotype, having seen Daguerre's work and seen uh, uh, the examples of other people's work uh, in these first uh, weeks of the daguerreotype. And this daguerreotype, in all likelihood, is again made with the first full-size camera 
that he made the mirror for. It took two months to grind the mirror, a 12-inch mirror, to make a large format version of the camera, and that was done by Henry Fitz. <clears throat> Walcott was not the only experimenter with portraiture in New York. Morse and uh, uh, a, another person, John Draper, working at New York University. Here's the building of New York University, which was on the corner of uh, the northern corner of uh, Washington Square Park, if, you're, if you know New York. And they both were making daguerreotype portraits in uh, this building in late October of 1839 and were trying to establish a commercial business as well. Examples of their portraiture from this period do not uh, exist really in the original. There's a copy of one of Morse's pictures. Uh, they are often listed as the first to make portraits in the United States, but the claim, uh, I think, is not as strong as uh, Walcott's claim. This is Morse's camera. Both Draper and Morse were working with lens cameras. All of the people who were working with lens cameras were working with exposures of three minutes for portraiture in 1840. It wasn't until later on in the year of 1840, and I'll talk about that, that the exposure times were reduced for, for lens uh, cameras. The advantage that Walcott had was very, very great in the fact that it was much faster, much faster, and he was able to establish a commercial portrait uh, business uh, very soon. Here, he established in this building, I'll show you here, the building that has the American flag on it on that corner of Chambers Street and Broadway in that building, which was a famous building, which some of the first daguerreotypes uh, uh, seen in the United States of any quality, certainly ones that were made uh, by uh, Europeans, were exhibited in this building. It was virtually the center of the commercial uh, city, right across from City Hall. It's somewhat puzzling to scholars why exactly that building, uh, since as you see it, it, uh, here's the only photograph that I've been able to find of this building. The studio was uh, not on the roof. It didn't have uh, either access to the roof. It was on the third, not the, uh, excuse me, it was on the fourth floor, not the fifth floor. And uh, that's been puzzling people for a long time. The explanation is that it, the street, Chambers Street, which is uh, the street that's on the far corner, uh, is a east-west facing street. So all day the sun crosses Manhattan Island. And by the use of mirrors, like a heliostat for a telescope, they were able to bounce light into the studio all day long in order to make exposures all day long. Here you see the arrangement of the mirrors bouncing light in. The light, of course, was very intense, and that was filtered through bottles of uh, blue uh, copper sulfate as to work as a filter. The process also was sensitive only to blue light, and he, he believed that he was gaining a benefit from having just blue light on the sitter. And the light essentially came full force straight onto the face. The daguerreotype process sensitized only with iodine is very contrasty. You don't get very good middle tone rendition. You get pretty good highlights, pretty good uh, maximum densities, and very little in between. In order to have a good portrait, a lot of shadow you didn't want. So these very early portraits by uh, our standards today are not much to look at, but imagine the world before photography, which is impossible to, for us to imagine. It's absolutely impossible for us to, to think of the world with no photography and then one day the opportunity to see yourself through photography. Uh, so these portraits, which have never been very widely appreciated, even today are not widely appreciated, are the first of photographic portraits, and they're very interesting once you understand the conditions under which they were made. 
there are, are not many uh, extant that you can absolutely say were made with the Walcott camera. I'm happy to make the argument if you wish. I'm not going to use a lot of time. But here you see the first real photographs of human beings made in a commercial context, uh, not just as a curiosity or a scientific experiment, but uh, photography for, for pay. And indeed, in March of 1830, of 1840, excuse me, Walcott opened the first commercial studio for portrait photography in the world. Nobody contests that. Another example, which again, you might say is not the best uh, photographic portrait, but it's amongst the first of photographic portraits. When you look at that, it's an entirely different business. And you understand the room, the uh, wonder, the thrill of making your portrait by this means. Uh, it helps you to, to understand and uh, enhance this viewing experience. Uh, having to avert the eyes uh, from this light that's coming at you, which is blue. That's another thing to remember, how strange the room must have been. And facing this camera, which, you know, facing the camera for most people is mysterious, but a camera that has no lens, just a, a big open hole, even today makes people in a state of wonderment as to exactly uh, how does this uh, work. The quality improves steadily. What's important to understand about Walcott is not so much his achievement and invention of this camera, but he understood the, that he was the opportunity to make a business out of photography and continually improved the process. The exposure time was reduced from one minute down to eventually 10 seconds with iodine sensitizing only. The quality of the plate was improved. He was the first person to have plates made specifically for the application of the daguerreotype in the United States. He improved the plate. They improved all of the business of how do you arrange, how do you pose, how do you light. All of the, the mechanical and commercial aspects of portrait photography he undertook and not only uh, established for the field, for everybody else, he set the standard and continuously improved the photographic standard as well. Sharper and sharper, better tonal, tonal range, shorter and shorter exposure. Ultimately, the shortest exposure they made was 20 seconds for sitting for your portrait, all before 1842. A lot of these images are deteriorated and also diminish the quality of the image so that, for instance, the frosting of the maximum densities here uh, greatly reduce the quality of this image. But this is an example of a Walcott camera portrait made in 1840. In 18, late 1840, the business is going so well that uh, Johnson's father went to England to license the camera and studio business. The difference between New York and London, New York had 300,000 people, London had two and a half million. It was the largest city in the world and therefore the biggest market for portrait photography. So with a mind towards making money, with really riding the wave, the first, he caught the first wave and was riding it for a long, long time here. He rode it all the way to London. Johnson first went over. Uh, the license was sold to Richard Beard. The English will tell you that Richard Beard opened the first portrait studio in Europe, photographic portrait studio, and he did, but he was never the operator and never the never the photographer, never really directly involved with uh, the mechanics of the business. The English are not comfortable with admitting that it's uh, Walcott and Johnson, an American system that is the first portrait studio business system in England. But if you know England, uh, on Regent's uh, Street, Upper Regent Street, near Holborn Street, in a district that has many other 
uh, attractions like the British Museum, the panorama that was in London at that time, so another form of picture show, uh, close also to the Science Museum. On, uh, I don't have a pointer or I'd show you, but on Upper Regent Street, on the left-hand side of Regent Street, that little black building, that was the Royal Polytechnic Building, which was a institution where the latest in scientific novelties were shown to the general public on the roof of that building. Uh, Johnson established uh, the studio, you've seen many, many times this illustration of the studio, a circular room in which the glazing was uh, blue glass. They had a great difficulty in finding blue glass. The Walcott cameras you see high up on that shelf, two of them, uh, and the sitter having to be raised very high close to the light. It's a very accurate uh, uh, illustration of the studio. There's no time to explain it in great detail. That although it looks strange, and I, I wasn't able to make a slide that uh, gave you the sense of blue light, the room entirely illuminated with blue light. This was a display that was at the Science Museum in London, which has since been destroyed, but was a major uh, feature of uh, their uh, photographic history gallery. Uh, this is the experience you would have going to the Beard Studio to have your portrait made. Uh, the quality of the very earliest uh, images aren't particularly good by contemporary standards, but these are examples of uh, portraits that are made with the Walcott camera. They're not lens camera portraits. One of the better ones is of uh, uh, the English scientist Faraday, Michael Faraday, one of the most important figures uh, in science of the day. Everybody who was anybody, including Fox Talbot himself, went to have their portrait made uh, by Walcott and Johnson. And uh, Walcott uh, sold to Talbot a spherical mirror for a Walcott camera. That exists, it's in the Media Museum in Bradford, England, separate from the body of the camera. The body of the camera is uh, uh, recently transferred from the Science Museum to the Bradford Museum. So there are three Walcott cameras that exist in the world from the period, although you will be told by historians there are none. There virtually is no recognized photograph of the Walcott camera in a studio. There is one, however, I believe, and you see it here. This is the studio of Jabez Hogg. Jabez Hogg never worked as a photographer, uh, but he was very interested in photography. He later went on uh, to write a book on microscopy and became a, a, an ophthalmic surgeon. So he had a long career in uh, the science of vision and the eye. And you see in his little glass house, you see that big bla uh, black horizontal box that is in all likelihood a, a Walcott camera on top of a tripod. And unpublished, unknown to, to uh, scholars, uh, and unrecognized, even by the owner of this image. I didn't tell him exactly what it was when he showed it to me. This is held in private hands. Here's Jabez Hogg photographing John Johnson. This is a daguerreotype that also is in the National Media Museum in England. It shows Jabez Hogg working in the Beard Studio, it's identified, making a portrait of John Johnson, uh, not his father as it is listed. His father was a much older man. This is. Uh, uh, correspondent with John Johnson, and in all likelihood uh, is a good, well, a good possibility it's not made by uh, anyone other than Beard himself. The quality of the daguerreotype was improved consistently month by month. By the late 18, by late 1842, uh, Johnson and Walcott had worked out the use of not only iodine to sensitize, but the use of bromine or chlorine, which occurred to many, many people. But they're the ones that worked out the sequence iodine to bromine back to iodine again, which was the last improvement in the daguerreotype and reduced the exposure times down to as short as a second. Most daguerreotypes, portraits that you see, the exposure time is one to six seconds. And that was first worked out by Johnson and Walcott. 
this is a little understood, a little appreciated fact that they made so many improvements in the daguerreotype process. And uh, their last patent was, was a patent in England in 1843, early 1843, was for a daguerreotype projector in which daguerreotypes could be projected life-size. So it's the first of uh, the patents that have to do with the projection of photographs as well is a Walcott and Johnson invention. I made a full-size version out of cardboard of the Walcott camera, and uh, I made a daguerreotype uh, this about a year ago to satisfy myself that indeed it worked. Here you see my friend uh, in the studio posing for the picture. Here you see the view that I had before the camera. And here's a daguerreotype made with the Walcott camera, uh, which the exposure time was one minute with iodine sensitizing only. So everything that has been said about uh, their achievements by them uh, is really quite, quite so. It is not a fiction, it's not a fallacy, it was not an impractical camera. Uh, it was a very practical camera, but was not their only achievement. It was a very practical step towards practical photography, and they continued to build on it and build on it until both of them had to leave the profession in early 1843. Both of them were suffering from lung problems. Johnson believed it had to do with their experiments with chemistry. Here you see the studio, and this is a cartoon by the English uh, uh, artist Cruikshank. Uh, it is not a cartoon in the normal sense. These are not necessarily made up people. As a matter of fact, the man making the exposure and the man polishing the plate are uh, distinctly individuals. And it's uh, quite ironic that there is no portrait of Walcott, even though he's the man who made a photographic portraiture possible. But there is a good possibility that this represents uh, Alexander Walcott in particular. The other man looks very much like uh, the photographs of John Johnson. Uh, Walcott returned to the United States and almost immediately left uh, New York and moved back to his hometown in Connecticut, just outside the border of New York State in Stamford, Connecticut, and bought a little mill on the river here and uh, continued his experiments but working in isolation. He died that same year. Uh, he had tuberculosis at the age of something like 33, 34 years old. He died having uh, his handle on the success in photography. Had he lived, he would have been, well, the way George Eastman is remembered is how Alexander Walcott would have been remembered as the father of American photography. Certainly not Morse, it would have been Alexander Walcott. Um, He's buried in this cemetery. Today you can see from a satellite on your computer uh, where he's born by the miraculous technology of photography. A wonder upon wonder upon wonder upon wonder. His grave is lost. The, I've been to the cemetery. The church hardly has any life in it. The old cemetery is in great neglect. Uh, this man, there's no portrait of him. Uh, there's no headstone, there's virtually no memory or credit uh, for what he truly is uh, responsible for and should be remembered for. This is a general lesson of the history of photography. Uh, most of it is not there. We have a very simple understanding of photography and certainly the first days of photography in particular. Here's the site. He had opened a studio before the Chambers Street studio, in the house where he made his first experiments. This dismal street on First Street in New York City, there's no plaque, no monument, nobody's stopping and looking at this building as one of the great uh, sites of uh, photography's first days in the New World. Uh, it should be different, but uh, that's the way of history. It's a sad business, ultimately. It's a wonder and it's a woe at the same time. Uh, that's what I've learned from it. Following my curiosity, I came to really be 
not so happy, but sort of sad about Alexander Walcott. Uh, I don't know what to do with that feeling. But I think it's ironic that uh, the, I don't know, have you, has anyone here yet seen one of these Lytro cameras, these light field cameras, do you know about it? Anyone? Takes a picture that can always be brought into focus. Any type of focus, any field, in the picture can be brought into focus. You not heard about it yet? You'll see at the bottom, the future of photography hasn't quite arrived yet. I haven't yet seen one in the hands of anyone. But ironically, this future of photography the, is, you know, the gods that run this world have a wicked sense of humor. And uh, all you do is have to look and uh, you'll find these ironies everywhere. Even though Walcott is long gone, uh, this camera is misunderstood. Nobody's going to really uh, recognize that uh, the camera that's at the Smithsonian is the first camera made in America, not just the patent model, but the actual first camera made in America that we know clearly made the first portrait of a human being. It's all documented very well. The portraits existed up until 1862. They're reported in various different uh, journals as having been shown. All the business papers and those two portraits are lost. Anyway, photography is a wonder, and I'm uh, still in a great state of wonder about it. Thank you very much. Un modelo de tiempo. Perfecto. 45 minutos. Abrimos un espacio de 15 minutos para preguntas. Eh, yo no, no veo a la gente. Eh, acá. Pero esperen que llegue el micrófono. Eu gostaria de perguntar, a placa de prata que era usada no daguerrótipo, se tinha relação com a gravura em cobre da época, a técnica. Puede ser de vuelta, a ver si yo lo puedo decir en español. Puede ser de vuelta porque no entendí. Puede ser en inglés. Puede ser en inglés. Please, I don't understand the relations to the beginning of photograph, the silver plate with the copper plate of the engravings of the epoch. Yes, the the daguerreotype process comes out of the work of Niepce in essence. Niepce began his photographic experiments uh, with a concept more in keeping with photomechanical reproduction. It was stimulated by the invention of lithography. The French government had offered a uh, prize for a, a way to make lithographs without stone. The type of stone for lithography was not available in France. It uh, was a very limited uh, material source in France, but lithography was greatly embraced by the French. Uh, it was uh, Niepce's idea to have a, a planographic form of printing on a metal plate, uh, but the idea to form the image not by hand, but by light. So he was working with metal plates. When he formed the partnership with Daguerre, uh, he had already experimented with pewter plates, he experimented with glass, and with silver surface plates. The use of the silver was for the reflectivity of the plate, because the maximum densities were being formed by reflection. So it is Niepce that is uh, suggesting the use of the silver plate. Daguerre eventually makes a discovery 
uh, by an entirely different route, uh, but working on the same sort of plate. They had three photographic conventions before they announce, you know, they, Nieps dies before Daguerre brings the process, but they had three different processes that were not commercially viable. It was the daguerreotype that was commercially viable. It was good enough. And that was based upon sensitizing the silver with iodine, making it light sensitive, silver iodide. Exposure to light formed a latent image that could be developed with mercury. You have to understand what the daguerreotype. But it's a very odd uh, route, where all the other routes have to do with the darkening of silver on paper or leather. That's where they thought the invention was going to come. It comes from an entirely different uh, place. Alguien más quiere hacer una pregunta?